examples we've got here um, when we're looking at the shape of the ships we've got the bird ships which looks very much like the bird the turtle ships a staple of Korean um, the centipede ships which are shaped to be like a centipede and this is effectively a road a road um, galley um, we have the cargo that they were carrying so here we've got flat bottom driverine royal ships um, and the cargo in this instance is not porcelain as in our name of the porcelain roads but it's royalty so they're our royal ships uh, we've got the horse ships march one which were um, documented to be on the jungle her voyages so these were horses that we used for the warriors when they went to shore we've got Jantuan or warships um, we've got treasure ships Baotuan and this is the mock-up of what we believe the Jonghe treasure ships would have looked like. These are so named because of the vast amount of treasure they could carry in their holds. Um, and all of these ships were believed and recorded to be part of the flotillas that were used for the Jonghe fleet. The recorded dimensions of which can be seen here. So for those of you familiar with shipbuilding, you'll note the length to beam ratios are rarely, if all seen in European uh, shipbuilding. So for many years, um, in the West at least, this was a great cause of consternation, especially because ships, um, if we're looking at the overall lengths, were nowhere near uh, the same recorded lengths uh, as we have here and certainly not of the same recorded length to beam ratios. Um, the SS Great Britain, for example, was considered to be one of the largest ships ever built and it was a mere 100 metres long. But here we've got treasure ships of 44 approximately Jung, which is thought to be about 145 metres long. So the Ming Shi is a great um, source of information when we're talking about the ship building. Um, and if we come back to that um, and to some Ying Xing's or Ying Xing's examples, we've talked about ships that were named derived from their shapes, like the bird ships, the sea eels, the river bream, from the cargo that can, they can carry, the royal ships, the treasure ships, the horse ships, or what we haven't touched on yet is the mere materials from which they were made. Uh, and here we have traditional examples of pigskin rafts named um, because they are effectively uh, blown up uh, inflated um, pig skins that are strapped together with here we have a like a timber uh, timber deck if you would like uh, bamboo rafts and these are the famous um, bamboo rafts from Guilin in southern China we have the sampan uh, traditional wooden planked vessels um, meaning sam, sam and pan, originally meaning uh, three planks. And again, if we're coming back to this kind of work of nature and one author's understanding of what the ships were and were could be, we've got to consider the, um, the environment in which they operated. Um, so if we're coming back to China, we can look at our regional traditions. We have the Sha uh, Chuan or sand style ship, which is a flat bottomed ship used um, primarily in the Yellow Sea region in the north. And again, I've pointed Dalian because that's where we are there. We have the Fu uh, Chuan or Fujian style, which were of the East China Sea tradition. So this is kind of middle China. And these were deep V ocean going vessels similar to the Nanhai one, which many of you will be familiar with, and Guanchan or Guangdong ships of the South China Sea tradition. So this is in and around Guangzhou and Hong Kong, um, Guangzhou formerly being Canton. Um, and we've got an example of this Guangchong ship now. So this is really the South China Sea tradition. And it's the South China Sea tradition that many think of 
when they're talking about this hybridization between a Chinese style and a Southeast Asian style. But our researchers indicate that it's not the hybridization of a Chinese and a Southeast Asian style. It's an adaptation um, to the environment. So they are hybrid hulls. Um, we believe the construction of which was outsourced to Southeast Asian shipbuilders when China suffered severe deforestation um, and economic depression in the early Ming dynasty. And this is in the lead up to the Ming ban. Uh, the timber shortage, um, and here you've got a comparison between the Fuchuan and the Sichuan vessel, the Fujian and the San style vessels. Um, but the timber shortage was not the result of shipbuilding per se, but thousands of years of iron manufacture primarily for agrarian purposes. Although we do have archaeological evidence that iron was used in shipbuilding as early as 310 BCE. So we believe that the Ming court's order to build approximately 27,000 uh, naval vessels, most of which were in this Fuchuan uh, tradition, or Fujian tradition, um, for the tributary missions which took place in the early Ming dynasty and went through Southeast Asia. We know we've got evidence of the steelays that have been um, erected in Southeast Asia and uh, to Sri Lanka, namely. Um, but this simply exacerbated the problem and brought it to a head earlier than it would have otherwise been the case. So generally found in the north, the Sha Chuan, which I just showed you a minute ago, were widely recognized as shallow draft flatter bottomed coastal traders. Um, the general form resembles that of a piece of bamboo split along the length, the nodal walls or scepter acting like a transom bow, transom stern and transverse bulkheads compartmentalizing the hull. Um, these vessels have low waterline side rudders and multiple masts adapted to the shallow shoals of the Yellow Sea where inshore waters are shallow and changing. Um, other structural features of the Chinese vessels, not just the Sha Chuan and Fu Chuan, but the um, Guan Chuan as well, include longitudinal whales, stepped mast, iron dew nails, L-shaped gua du brackets, and complex department, uh, complex dovetailed scarf joints with the ability to restrain movement in almost all degrees of freedom. And here you can see the Nanhai Wan and its compartmentalized design. Uh, Chinese softwoods for use for planks and whales. Fuchuan vessels, on the other hand, if we go back, I guess, to this image, had a sharper, deep V-shaped keel, as I mentioned, a significantly deeper draft, and were fast and easily maneuverable in the treacherous waters of Hangzhou Bay and south of Shanghai. They also used Chinese softwoods for planks and whales. Um, but to date, there's been no evidence of a Sha Chuan vessel being found in an archaeological context. We have the riverine vessels and we have the Fu Chuan vessels, but not the Sha Chuan. We think this is because of the Ming ban, the period of maritime prohibition which took place kind of around 1368 to 1567, which banned all private ocean going vessels and only allowed the government vessels, the government voyages such as the Zhong He voyages, um, to take place and for those to be the official interaction with foreigners. This resulted in ships with no more than two masks, um, typically coastal traders, being destroyed and their construction illegal. Um, the Ming court then dealt, and I'm flicking through these images of the Nanhai one so you can see the compartmentalized um, design, but it resulted in ships with more than two masts being destroyed, their construction made illegal. Um, so it stands to reason that Chinese vessel of this period um, are naval. And the Nanhai one I'm showing you though is about 1137 or 1179. So it's a little bit um, earlier to that. So most of the pre-Ming vessels located to date originate from Southeast Asia um, 
all have been attributed to the South China Sea uh, tradition and attributed as Chinese, such as the book at Jackass Fulquop, Kosi Changwan and the Hoi An wreck. And this is due to the presence of the bulkheads that you have been uh, looking at, um, that in outsourced vessels we understand aren't watertight, whereas in Chinese domestically produced vessels um, they are. It's not just the bulkheads though, we have the layered planking seen here on the Lena Shoal wreck. Um, we have evidence of this back to kind of 1179, but it's not being seen until significantly later in Dutch vessels around 1565. We have the uh, complex dovetail scarf joints, which I mentioned, the lime based caulking, called chanam, which is lime and hemp together, um, seen here on the Baku wreck. Suspended axial rudders, also seen here, recovered from the Longjiang shipyard in Nanjing. And they are, however, just uh, the South China Sea tradition vessels, or the hybridized vessels, are uh, distinguished by the presence of hardwood planks and whales, not the softwood that we see in China. And timber dowels, uh, <coughs> which are not associated with Chinese shipbuilding of that period. So innovation, hull hybridization, and technological transfer <coughs> provides us with a plausible explanation for the presence of Chinese features within the shipwrecks of Southeast Asian origin. And I should mention that this shipyard is the shipyard in Nanjing from where that, <coughs> excuse me, rudder was uh, recovered. So we have our list of Chinese kind of shipbuilding um, features and we believe that innovation, hybridization and technological transfer provide us with a plausible explanation for the presence of Chinese features within Southeast Asian ships. <coughs> and those wrecks confirmed as Chinese are of the Fuchuan vessel and date the pre Ming ban. Um, they include Korea's Shenan ship and Malaysia's Turiang ship. Um, both have softwood planks and whales fashioned from native Chinese species with mason pine and Maui song for the keel. Because of its excellent strength and durability, bulkheads and beams and mast steps were shaped from solid camphor or jangmu, uh, emanating from the Manchus Asian subgenus of the laurel family. Namu was also used for rudder seats or Chinese pine or shanmu for the remaining deccan structure. The exception seems to be the Baku wreck in Indonesia. It's hoped that forthcoming fieldwork will reveal more about this as coins recovered from the wreck date it to 1403 to 1423 to that period of Zhonghe and also contemporary with the wreck that we're here working on um, in Indonesia. If this is proved correct, it could be the first Ming naval wreck found in an archeological context. Um, so please watch this space. Thank you um, deeply to Nagari Rampi Foundation um, for when I have been running halfway across the country to find working Wi-Fi. So I'm deeply grateful not only to Ms. Diaya from the Indonesian Embassy, but from everyone at the foundation and those universities and organizations that have supported us in this work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And goodbye. goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Dr. Sarah Ward, for your valuable knowledge. And we will continue to the next schedule, which is the presentation from panel 6B, which will be moderated by Dr. Sonny Mibisono DA. Pak Sonny, are you there? Pak Sonny, are you ready for the panel 6B? Yes, I'm ready. 
All right. Wait. Thank you so much. Time is yours. So thank you very much, uh, Bu Anita. And I think uh, wait for a moment. I have a, a problem on connection first. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And we'll, we'll come back to the session of International Forum of uh, Spice Road. So this evening, we will continue the presentation and discussion. And as already noted, this, this, the, the theme of this panel is, is the seafaring and traditional the trading route. Uh, in my note, there are seven speakers in the session. So I follow the guide. This session will take a place in one panel. So uh, the time will be end in the uh, 17, 15, uh, uh, so uh, let me confirm the, the presence the, of the speakers so that I have, I will uh, list it the, the, the panelists so that the first is Mrs. Putri Maya Mashita with the, the title of the uh, paper is Dynamic of Shipping and Trade Network at the Ambon Port 1853 and 1889. The Belt of Road Initiative and Indonesian Spice Route, an ecological critical study and revitalization of spice root culture. The third is Mr. Ahmad. Suchayadi. Uh, the title of the paper is the Spice Route for Sea Tourism in Indonesian Archipelago. So, and, and the fourth, uh, uh, Muhammad Bagas Prasetyo, the internal colonialism of Sumatran local elite, the, pa the paper trade and violation of communal land in uh, Southeast Sumatra, 16th until 17th century. And then, so, and then uh, the fifth uh, presentation is uh, Leonie Stevens and Lily uh, Julianti Farid. The title of the paper is The, the Social History of the uh, Three Punks Network. And the next is uh, uh, Ms. Kelly Clayton. So the, about the, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not, the estimating of the, wait, sorry, because this is, uh, estimating of capacity of the Makassan Prau to uh, carry commodity such as Tripang. So, and the, and the last, but not least, the uh, Miss uh, Ariandi Novita, uh, title of the presentation is the Palembang Commodity and the Global Trade of Network. So I will uh, start to the first uh, speaker, Mr. Putri Maha, Maha Mashita. So the time is yours. Thank you very much. Hello? 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 Iya, Pak. Terdengar, Pak. Hello. The uh, first. Yeah. Okay. Hello. 
Yes, please. Assalamualaikum saya Putri Maimasita pada kesempatan ini akan mempresentasikan makalah yang berjudul Dinamika Pela Jaringan Pelayaran dan Perdagangan di Pelabuhan Ambon tahun 1853 sampai 1889. Oke, okay, uh, langsung saja uh, diskursus mengenai Maluku seringkali tidak terlepas dari eksistensi rempah-rempah sebagai komoditas utama perdagangan. Tidak dapat dipungkiri bahwa rempah-rempah telah berhasil menempatkan Maluku. sebagai magnet bagi dunia internasional. Sejak Belanda menguasai Maluku, baik pada waktu dan monopoli yang dilakukan ini uh, tidak hanya monopoli perdagangan, melainkan juga monopoli produksi dan monopoli uh, pelayaran. Nah, secara tidak langsung hal ini membatasi ruang gerak para pedagang uh, per perdagangan bagi masyarakat setempat. Jika kita membaca literasi tentang perdagangan maupun pelayaran rempah-rempah, banyak dari literasi tersebut yang fokus pada masa kejayaan rempah-rempah di Pulau Ternate sebelum abad 19. Yang perlu kita ketahui bahwa pada awal abad 19 setelah, setelah pemerintah Belanda berhasil mengambil alih Maluku dari tangan Inggris, tepatnya 1817, pusat produksi rempah-rempah dipindahkan dari Ternate ke Ambon, mulai dari Jadi usaha untuk uh, membudidayakan ke komoditas-komoditas lainnya di Pulau Ambon dan sekitarnya. Kemudian memasuki abad ke-19, pemerintah Hindia Belanda mengambil dua kebijakan penting uh, untuk pelayaran dan perdagangan di Pelabuhan Ambon. Nah, yang pertama pada 1853 pemerintah Hindia Belanda Membuka pelabuhan Ambon sebagai pelabuhan bebas Yang kemudian kebijakan ini diikuti dengan Tidak diberlakukannya lagi kebijakan monopoli perdagangan 1864 Secara tidak langsung ini merupakan kebijakan yang sangat bertolak belakang Dengan kebijakan yang diterapkan pemerintah Belanda dari zaman VOC Yakni kebijakan monopoli perdagangan Hal tersebut e, menimbulkan pertanyaan yang kemudian akan dibahas e, di makalah ini. Yang pertama itu bagaimana potensi komoditas perdagangan di Maluku Tengah setelah eksistensi rempah-rempah menurun. Kemudian yang kedua bagaimana perubahan pelayaran dan perdagangan di Pelabuhan Ambon selama Uh, pelabuhan bebas itu diperlakukan Sebelum masuk ke pembahasan Saya akan menjelaskan metode penelitian yang saya gunakan Yakni metode penelitian sejarah Di mana menggunakan beberapa data penting uh, Pada masa uh, abad ke-19 Tepatnya masa Periode pelabuhan bebas, yakni data statistik, oversize, van, van den handel, and scape part, in the Netherlands, the sitting in, in Oz, Indi, Britain, Java, and Madura. Kemudian, disambung dengan statistik van den handel, and scape part, uh, and then in, and oi for rechten. Ini tahun 1870 sampai 1908. Kemudian, ada han, handel for rechten yang merupakan laporan perdagangan, kemudian ada Stadblad Panay Netherlands ini. Data-data uh, tersebut kemudian didukung juga dengan data Algemeen Verslag, Colonel Verslag, dan lain sebagainya. Walaupun sebenarnya data-data ini tidak uh, seutuhnya lengkap, jadi ada beberapa data yang uh, masih kurang, terutama tahun-tahun 1870-an, sampai 1900-an. Namun data ini dikolaborasikan dengan jurnal atau buku-buku 
penulis sebelumnya. Jadi bisa diverifikasikan kemudian diinterpretasikan uh, dalam penulisan uh, paper ini. Selanjutnya saya membandingkan dua periode masa pemerintahan Belanda di mana e, di dua periode ini wilayah Maluku yang disebut dengan Gouvernemen der Maluku itu secara administrasi berbeda. Yang pertama periode VOC yang dimaksud dengan Gouvernemen der Maluku pada masa VOC itu merupakan wilayah Maluku Utara sekarang yang di mana itu terdiri dari Ternate, Tidore, Makian, Bacan yang berpusat di Pulau Ternate Kemudian wilayah Ambon dan wilayah Banda Itu berdiri sendiri dengan nama Gouvernement Van Amboina Dengan pusat di Pulau Ambon Dan Gouvernement Van Banda Yang berpusat di Pulau Banda Nah, kemudian Memasuki periode Hindia Belanda Wilayah administrasi ini berubah Masa Hindia Belanda Yang, yang dinamakan dengan Gouvernement der Malukan Itu gabungan antara Gouvernement Van Banda yang Amboina dan Gouvernement Van Banda yang kemudian pusat eh, administrasinya itu ada di Pulau Ambon. Ini terjadi sekitar 1817 dan sedangkan eh, Ternate itu berdiri sendiri menjadi residensi Ternate. Nah, dalam penelitian ini, dalam paper ini yang dijadikan fokus penelitian yakni di uh, wilayah Maluku Tengah di mana uh, pusat perdagangannya berada di uh, pelabuhan Ambon. Oke, okay. uh, pembukaan pelabuhan bebas. Pembukaan pelabuhan bebas itu dilatar belakangi karena adanya persaingan perdagangan antara uh, Belanda dan Inggris untuk merebut tanah merebut tanah jajahan. Kemudian uh, Belanda dan Inggris melakukan perundingan yang dinamakan dengan uh, Traktat London 1824 di mana uh, Belanda sepakat untuk membuka beberapa pelabuhan yang ada di Hindia Belanda sebagai pelabuhan bebas. Nah, salah satunya itu yakni pelabuhan Ambon yang ada di Maluku Tengah. Nah, ini tercatat dalam Statblad Netherland Indina nomor 98, di mana pasal pertamanya itu eh, Belanda akan membuka beberapa pelabuhan penting di Maluku untuk kebutuhan ekspor dan impor, terutama pelabuhan. Nah, pelabuhan Ambon ini fungsinya sebagai supply station, di mana komoditas-komoditas yang ada di beberapa wilayah di Maluku Tengah itu akan didistribusikan di beberapa daerah atau pelabuhan lainnya. Kemudian eh, seperti halnya pelabuhan-pelabuhan bebas lainnya sebenarnya bebas yang dimaksud oleh Belanda dalam hal ini bebas bersyarat. Jadi tidak semua yang melakukan pelayaran dan perdagangan itu bisa sebebas-bebasnya. Melainkan Belanda membuat eh, jail pass atau istilahnya surat izin untuk melakukan eh, perdagangan ataupun berlabuh di pelabuhan. Nah, ini merupakan uh, pelabuhan Ambon yang ada di Pulau Ambon dan sekitarnya. Kalau dilihat dari peta Indonesia, itu ada di sekitar. Kemudian, potensi komoditas perdagangan yang ada di pelabuhan Ambon. Nah, di pelabuhan Ambon uh, terdapat komoditas lokal dan juga komoditas yang import. Komoditas lokal itu terdiri dari sagu, kemudian kelapa dan lain sebagainya dan sedangkan kopi, coklat, tembakau itu merupakan komoditas yang sengaja dibudidayakan oleh pemerintah Hindia Belanda guna untuk mempertahankan perekonomian Maluku setelah rempah-rempah, harga rempah-rempah itu turun. Kemudian kalau komoditas impor itu komoditas eh, yang eh, komoditas impor itu komoditas yang diperdagangkan dari luar kemudian tidak ketutup kemungkinan komoditas impor ini juga yang kemudian kembali diekspor atau dijual eh, kembali ke wilayah-wilayah atau pulau-pulau di sekitar pulau. 
Lanjut kalau dilihat dari data over 700 data pelayaran perdagangan uh, tahun 1854 sampai 1869 itu komoditas ya, impor yang paling tinggi atau yang paling sering di uh, datangkan yaitu kain lena. Kemudian ada beras dan beberapa uh, macam komoditas yang memang uh, jarang atau tidak ada di Maluku. Komoditas ekspornya, uh, seperti yang kita lihat di sini, kain lena menempati urutan pertama sebagai komoditas ekspor yang notabene-nya kain lena merupakan komoditas impor. Nah, komoditas lainnya itu merupakan komoditas-komoditas lokal yang ada di Kepulauan Maluku, seperti penyu, tripang, rempah-rempah tentunya, minyak kayu putih, kemudian uh, coklat, dan lain sebagainya, dan juga ada pak. Kemudian perubahan eh, jaringan pelayaran perdagangan di Pelabuhan Ambon semenjak dibuka sebagai pelabuhan bebas menjadi perdagangan interinsular. Di mana interaksi eh, di Pelabuhan Ambon itu didominasi oleh para pedagang lokal. Kontak antara Ambon dan Ternate, kemudian Ambon dan Banda, dan lain sebagainya, dan banyak eh, para pedagang lainnya sangat tinggi pada periode ini. Kemudian di dalam laporan perdagangan eh, di inventaris Ambon nomor 586 Arsip Nasional Republik Indonesia ada sekitar di situ dilaporkan ada sekitar 93 kapal yang berlabuh di pelabuhan Ambon dari wilayah yang berbeda seperti dari Banda, Ternate, Caparua dan lain sebagainya. Notabene-nya hal seperti ini tidak bisa dilihat pada masa monopoli perdagangan yang diterapkan sebelum uh, 1853. Jadi selain itu uh, di sini juga kita bisa lihat kapal-kapal dari uh, wilayah Eropa lainnya akan menggunakan beberapa bendera yang memang diwajibkan sama pemerintah Hindia Belanda untuk menggunakan bendera-bendera dari daerah asalnya seperti seperti bendera Belanda dari Amsterdam, Amerika, dan Spain. Oke, okay, dari hal itu kita bisa ambil kesimpulan bahwa pada abad ke-19 setelah eksistensi rempah-rempah berkurang, komoditas penting di pulau ini bergeser. Komoditas impor seperti kain lena, arak, beras, dan lain-lain masih menjadi kebutuhan penting bagi masyarakat Maluku Tengah, namun untuk ekspor rempah-rempah mengalami penurunan dari tahun ke tahun. Sebagian besar komoditas ekspor merupakan komoditas impor yang dijual kembali. Kedua, sejak berkelakunya kebijakan pelabuhan bebas dan penghapusan monopoli perdagangan, perdagangan di pelabuhan Ambon semakin diramaikan oleh para pedagang lokal. Meski komoditas utama di kawasan ini bukan lagi rempah-rempah, namun masih ada komoditas lokal yang masih aktif diperdagangkan, walaupun dalam jumlah kecil seperti sagu, kulit penyu, damar, dan lain sebagainya. Oke, sekian presentasi uh, makalah saya. Lebih dan kurangnya saya mohon maaf. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Putri, and then very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, the dynamic uh, spice trade from two periods, I think. Just many changes occur, and
Recording in progress. 42% uh, of energy uh, sector financing by Chinese bank in 218. Uh, this is uh, certainly contrary, contrary, contrary to global efforts to reduce uh, emission, especially from the energy sector. Next. The second discusses about uh, alternative uh, discourse on the Indonesian species. The construction of force of for bare eye facilities should pay attention to uh, ecological society. by complying with the applicable operational uh, standard. Meanwhile, the alternative solution continue is to build adequate uh, water treatment plant facilities. Next. Uh, meaning must be carried out uh, according to technological standard with the artificial with land method to reduce, to reduce the burden of water pollution to us not to cause water pollution. It is also necessary to carry out strike uh, supervision of nickel factory for operation in order to maintain a comfortable environment in, for the community and the ecological it is also necessary to strip for the nickel factory to reach zero emission next now uh, the third uh, about this discuss about archipelago maritime culture uh, the construction maritime uh, era of or the maritime heyday in uh, Arch archipelago is general often associated by, uh, with the heyday of the kingdom maritime culture is a word that is already in the, the, the dictionary long before the west introduced the word maritime the maritime here also refers to the past which is related to the historical site in this case representing to create kingdom sriwijaya and majapahit uh, thus, this is in line with the opinion which says the fast, the fast uh, can be used the capital realizing uh, the share filling community and factor forming the entity uh, of nation. Next, uh, the next is archipelago maritime uh, culture about both culture uh, in the meaning. Uh, Maritime culture, the boat is symbol on and metaphor the describe of social cultural life in the Marchipela community. This is an influence by several cultures that are common by referral several regions uh, in Indonesia. The first in the Lampung community there are is young life uh, of means of transportation between by Mandar uh, fishermen. Next. Uh, next, uh, discuss about Belt and Road Initiative and Revitalization of Indonesian Maritime Culture. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative Revitalization uh, of Indonesian Maritime Culture, the maritime era or the maritime heyday in the archipelago is generally often associated with the heyday of the kingdom. Maritime culture is a war. is already in the dictionary long before the West introduced the word maritime. It's in uh, our history, there are influence uh, and relationship between community of various nations. These roots uh, have important meaning for several nations in economic, political, legal, social, and cultural aspects. Uh, next. Uh, in building mutual trust in bare eye, the other imposing emphasis the importance of intercultural learning or understanding which can be used the basis for the next, uh, the new two-way instant uh, strategy. Uh, theor theoretically, through intercultural understanding, one can learn how to see things through other eyes and how to add their knowledge in our vocabulary to develop uh, efficiency intercultural communication competency uh, as, a guide, as a guide for individuals uh, or members as group. Uh, next. Now, uh, there are uh, about uh, impact uh, in federalism is uh, extremely significant uh, cause of cultural difference and social behavior between countries. Uh, next, uh, individual 
BRI Initiative Partner Country as being vulnerable to the distress uh, of which uh, are found to be high risk of credit default uh, as a result in the BRI Initiative related, uh, related uh, finance. And, uh, and third, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of local worker in Indonesia for the construction of nickel factory to meet the research needs to green city in China. Uh, this make uh, people who initially face the sea for their livelihoods, life then, life, then left the sea and go to the mainland to build a green city owned by China. Next. Uh, making the species root of world heritage uh, and reference uh, to strength of cultural diplomacy to strengthen Indonesia, the world maritime access is sometimes something to be proud of. However, there's not now. Another goal of reviving the spacing route is to remind the younger generation of, of how the slices route uh, shaped the nation, state, and civilization of Indonesia. The memory uh, of this, this special land uh, is expect to foster a collective awareness uh, and pride in the nation identity, as well to, uh, as to strengthen the uniting of Indonesian diversity throughout inter regional the cultural interaction they have built uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, them has proven that the meeting of people in the harbor, for example, becomes uh, an opportunity for the exchange of, of information, knowledge, tradition, and the arts even in the long term. It can change the character of individuals or group who, who meet each other. We are witnessing at this time how the people in the special uh, road points, such as Aceh, Riau Island, Medan, Jakarta, Semarang, and several other cities seem uh, to be so cosmopolitan. Uh, next. Uh, that's all from our group presentation. That's all from me. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, and see you. Hello, Pak Sony. Pak Sony, you are still mute. Hello. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Yes, please, Pak Sony. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad and colleague. So I think this is also uh, interesting research with this group of researchers. So it's all, uh, very challenging. So especially when they interpreting the historical trade from the past to the modern trade, especially facing to the new outlook of our initiative. So we will uh, move to the next presentation of Mr. Ahmad Sujijayandi, the title of the uh, paper is the spice route for situism and Indonesian archipelago. So the time is yours, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmad Sunyayadi. Today, I would like to present my presentations: spice route for sea tourism in Indonesian archipelago. In 2020, through the Ministry of Education and Culture, the Indonesian government proposed the Spice Route as a World Heritage UNESCO. The Spice Route is an Indonesian identity program that many people have forgotten. It was the forerunner of commodity trade carries out by the Indonesian's ancestors and tribes. The route started from east to west of the archipelago and also went to several countries in the world. And the Spice Route program is a possible land rejuvenation herbal medicine industry and tourism package. So it is not only a legacy, it is important to revive the space route in Indonesia to be utilized, one of which is for the tourism sector, especially sea tourism. The questions that arise is, how the space route from the past can be used for sea tourism in the Indonesian archipelago? 
The aim is to trace elements of the space route from the past that can be used for sea tourism in Indonesia today. Using historical methods, this research is carried out through primary and secondary sources. Primary sources in the form of travelogues, travel guidebooks at the end of the 19th century to the 20th century are combined with local sources as well as secondary sources. The term of the space route we can find on UNESCO website. It relates with Vatican Silk Roads. According to UNESCO, the space route is the name given to the network of sea routes that link the east with the west. It is also known as Maritime Silk Roads. The route where the territory of the countries associated stretch from the west coast of Japan through the Indonesian archipelago around India to the lands of the Middle East and from the Middle East across the Mediterranean to Europe. According to historical records, people have traveled the space routes from very early history. Although Silk was just one of the commodities traded along the Silk Road, people across the globe are more familiar with the Silk Road than the space route. However, concerning South Asian trade, many experts prefer to use the name space route because the spaces such as papers, nutmeg, nutmeg flowers, cloves, and sandalwood where the main commodities produced and traded in the Southeast Asia region. The first historical text, Negara Kartagama, originated in 1365, mentioned the existence of extensive relations in the archipelago. This text was written by Mpu Prapancha, who lived in the Majapahit period. In Negara Kartagama appeared many place names in Indonesian archipelago for the first time in history. These places are the conquered areas of Majapahit. In the Garakata Gama, the conquered areas of Majapahit in, were divided into four groups. The first group is Malay countries. The second group is located on Tanjung Negara Islands, the present day is Kalimantan. The third group is the Malay Peninsula. The fourth group included all place names which located on eastern of Java. They are from Bali to Nusa Tenggara, Sulawesi, Maluku and Papua. Before European influence entered the archipelago, a shipping route was formed which cannot be separated from the role of the wind as a natural factor. The most important element in the space route trade is the role of the monsoons. Merchants on the north coast of Java, such as from Gresik, during the eastern monsoon season, sailing to the Straits of Malacca, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Patani, and the ports of Siam with junk boats. They sail with the western monsoon season to the islands of Nusa Tenggara, Maluku Islands, Bhutan, and Mindanao. The role of monsoons of maritime connections in the Southeast Asia region also as maritime zone. Before the presence of westerners has a number of sub-maritime zones which embracing thousands of islands and was actively involved in interregional as well as international shipping trade. There were five maritime zones in Southeast Asia. The first maritime zone was the Bay of Bengal. The second was the Strait of Malacca. The third was the South China Sea. And the fourth maritime zone was the Sulu. The fifth zone was the Java Sea, which had connections with the Lesser Sunda Islands, the Maluku Islands, the Eastern, Western, Southern Coast Borneo, and Southern Coast of Sumatra. The Java Sea zone, which is the area of the Indonesian archipelago, got attention by the Dutch East Indies government at the end of the 19th century. They used the Java Zay zone to solve the problem of inter-island shipping. The Dutch established Koninklijk Pekkerpad Maskapay of KPM, a shipping company that served the entire archipelago and it has played an important role in the archipelago. In Reskits for Netherlands India, a guidebook that was published at the request of the KPM, there were some sea routes using by the KPM. It divided to a western region of Sumatra and eastern region for Celebus and Maluku Islands. Based on the route served by the KPM ships, it is most likely that this shipping company laid the foundations for sea tourism pay practice in Indonesia. It is actually difficult to know the origin of sea tourism in the Indonesian archipelago. The first thing is to try to trace the definitions or the concept of sea tourism. In addition to the term or the concept of sea tourism, it is also known as marine tourism and coastal tourism. 
The medical tourism defined as including those recreational activities that involve travel away from one's place of residence and which have as their host or focus the marine environment, where the marine environment is defined as those waters which are saline and tide affected. It states that the marine tourism participation included swimming in the ocean, grazing, sea fishing, enjoying sea views, visiting an island, staying at marine's resort, visiting a fishing port or sea village, marine sport and marine use, and marine health activities, marine ecotourism, and enjoying sunrises or sunsets in marine locales. The important sources for tracking the early of sea tourism activities in Indonesia are travelogues and tourist guide books. The experience written by travelers in the travelogues become important information to know the early of sea tourism activities in Indonesia. For example, all the travelogues are from Henry Forbes, Anna Forbes, and Emily Richings. For example, all the travel guidebooks are Red Skits for Netherlands India, Get to the Dutch East Indies, Get to the Netherlands India, and Tristan Race Nada Molukan. The articles from the newspapers are also important sources. From the primary sources, we found that the early sea tourism activities in Indonesia archipelago, such as enjoying sea view, enjoying sunrise and sunset, sea bathing, sailing, visiting sea garden, saying that if he's a man. As the conclusions, the space route can be used for sea tourism, especially as special interest tourism in Indonesia, and from sources as travelogues, guidebooks, and newspapers articles, it can be seen that traces of sea tourism activities have existed since the colonial period. And this makes Indonesian has opportunities from the space routes for sea tourism, such as by facilitating modern travelers from around the world to travel the route, providing an authentic experience for them with cultural, historical, and archaeological heritage, Solving the distinct characteristic and the diversity of each region in Indonesia. The cooperations of all relevant parties, but the governments, the private sectors, academics, the media, is important to realize this idea. Thank you for your attentions. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ahmad. And then I think it's also interesting because the uh, uh, this is a new outlook of the uh, spice food. It's not really for the writing uh, history, but also uh, making the uh, uh, story of uh, spice food to be the the journey to the uh, the island of. Rempah, I think. So the I will continue the presentation so that uh, for
Recording in progress. Route. Now, many of you here at this forum will already have knowledge of the trepang trade between Makassar and Northern Australia. But briefly, Makassar-based fishing operations visited Northern Australia in sustained and widespread seasonal operations from at least the late 1600s. The locations range from Kayujawa in the Kimberley, which is, if you follow my cursor in this area here, um, on the northwest side of the continent to Marege, which is across the top end of, of Arnhem Land, um, and down to sites in Yanua country down here, so deep into the Gulf of Carpentaria. Terms were mutually agreed, and there was a cultural exchange of technology, food, language, and of course, people. The Trepang exports were shipped north to the Chinese market via Makassar and the Philippines, and probably other locations, in a trade that lasted for more than 300 years. This trade, this series of sustained encounters, predated the British colonisation of Australia, and perhaps also Dutch and Spanish presence in the area. Um, the dating is something that the archaeologists are looking into now. The Australia Macassar aspect of the Trepang trade is becoming better known every year, and many of you might have read Campbell McKnight's work and others. But the deeper or furtherest extent of the trade, for example, exactly how these links extended to the Philippines and north to the destination market in China, is less well known. We want to put that known Australian Macassar aspect of the trade into the broader context of the ports and markets linking Australia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, Korea and China. This regional network which was economic but also social and cultural. Some of the questions that we want to ask or address include what is the evidence that Australian trepang, as is often been claimed, being prized on the, on the Chinese market? Were Australian trepang marketed as coming from particular seas or in a novel way? Did Australian trepang appear in other markets such as Japan, Taiwan or Korea? What's the relationship between historical trepang trade and Chinese and Japanese imperialism? And is there evidence of First Nations Australian peoples travelling north along the trade routes as they did to Makassar? But most importantly, what can we know of the lives of the people who fished, dried, processed, shipped, sold, bought and consumed the trepang? How did they interact and share goods, ideas, religions, language and kinship networks? From an Australian perspective, how far did ideas and people go out and exactly who and what came back? How were the people involved in the trepang trade affected by British colonisation in 1788 and again from 1907 when Southeast Asian participation in the trepang trade was effectively outlawed in Australia? Now, I've mainly spoken about the Australian perspective. I'll now hand you over to my colleague, Dr Lilly, to discuss the Asian perspective. Thank you, Leonie, and hi everyone. I'm also speaking from NARM or Melbourne, and I pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land, past and present. So from Australian perspective, we are now moving to Asian perspective. For Indonesia, in this context, for Makassar, the tripping thread networks consist of two themes. It's about past and present. As a part of Australia and Indonesia's shared history, the established contact which lasted for 300 years offers an opportunity to investigate Indonesian rich and advanced maritime technology and network that has shaped the global trade in Asia Pacific region from mid 18th century until early 20th century. Tripang had helped indigenous Australians, Tripangers from Makassar, Chinese merchants and consumers in southern China to connect and build a global connection. If in Northern Australia, there are islands and places named after Makassan Tripangers, such as Pobaso Island, Kayu Jawa, and Marege, in Jampea Island, Selayar of South Sulawesi province, 
there is a place called Labuan Marege. Labuan Marege means Port of Marege. Sailors from Makassar called Northern Australia as Marege. In Labuan Marege, 100 years ago, 100 years ago, Tripangers from Makassar transited in Labuan Marege to get fresh water and sometimes build small canoes or lepa lepa before continuing their voyage to Australia. The tripang trade that connected Australia and Indonesia was held after the introduction of a new law in 1906-1907. However, tripang industry in Indonesia has never been halted. From an initial survey conducted by Peter Spillett, an Australian historian in Makassar in 1977, all sailors in Makassar and surrounding islands revealed that they were still active in Irian or Papua and other parts of East Indonesia. Our last observations in South Sulawesi earlier this year also indicated that small and middle-scale tripang industry are still running their businesses, exporting the commodity to other Asian countries, mainly to Hong Kong and South Korea. Now, back to the past, the next slide, please. There have been celebrations, commemorations, featuring the commemorative voyage of Hati Marige, a traditional Padewakan Prau in 1988 from Makassar to Yirkala, Northern Australia, and the next slide, an ongoing project called Nur Al Marike, a film documentary that depicts a role of three banks from Makassar in introducing Islam in Australia. One question remains for us in Indonesia. When and how do we start to lead initiatives to celebrate this relatively unknown history in our own country? In order to showcase the advancement of our maritime culture and technology for Indonesian people. The way we perceive our identity and belonging depends on how we interpret and retelling our past. The ancient tribal network that clearly demonstrate Indonesia's advanced maritime culture and technology in the past should be widely shared for our young generations. Next slide, please. So when streaming people-to-people -people stories in Asia-Pacific, which Tripang as the primary medium, is one of our research objectives. From the story of Padewa Kang, the traditional boat that had connected, we aim to extend our knowledge of the tripang throughout the region. Of course, your feedback and work. Thank you. And hand over to you, Leon. You are muted. Thank you. And um, we welcome any questions um, and um, sort of input from scholars who are here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your book presentation. So it remind me to the the book of Campbell McLeod, I think. Uh, but uh, we have here a new perspective of the story of Makassan Trepang, I think. But this paper, I think, really Meeting capacity of Makassan Prau to carry commodities such as tripang. So the time is yours, Kelly. Thank you. My presentation is about estimating Indonesian Prau capacity to carry trade commodities. But my title mentions two terms that I should explain at the start, Makassan and Maregi. Mariners from the Indonesian archipelago visited Northern Australia annually from the 17th century until 1907 to collect and process trepang or sea cucumber. 
The mariners came from many ethnic groups, including the Bajal, Bugus, Makassar, and Malay and Sumbawan mariners that were based around Makassar. However, the collective term Makassan has been used in Australia since 1969 to refer to these mariners. It's a convenient shorthand term since many of the visiting Parau originated from the city of Makassar. Maragi is the name that Makassans gave North Australia, an area that's now known as the Northern Territory. The data I use today relates to those Makassans sailing the eastern route to the Gulf of Carpentaria as shown on the map. The problem I have investigated is how much volume did a Macassan prowls to pan cargo fill? I could find little historical documentation of how Macassans maximised prow cargo hold capacity or how they allocated capacity to different commodities. But I did find four sources tangential to the topic. Firstly, Bugis navigation and commercial law was codified by Amanagapa of Wajo, southwest Sulawesi, in 1676. But while this addresses the rights of merchant passengers with accompanying trade goods, it doesn't discuss cargo capacity, stowage or management. Secondly, there is ethnographic research into the 20th century timber carrying trade by the maritime communities of southwest Sulawesi, Bhutan, Madura and Wakatobi Islands. But these generalise that a combination of different type cargo types and use of deck space as well as cargo holds makes maximum use of prow cargo carrying capacity. There's also hints that the so-called navel of the prow can be used to indicate if a prow can take more cargo. Thirdly, the Indigenous people of Northern Australia depicted the cargo holds of Macassan prows in their rock art, but they focused on the trade goods that they wanted from the Macassans, not what commodities the Macassans exported. For example, the bottom figure is of an ochre painting at Man Kala Rock Shelter on Groot Island in the Gulf of Carpentaria. It shows cargo holds containing dugout canoes, but other shapes are depicted by generic shapes. Finally, in 1803, observers on HMS Investigator wrote that the Macassans filled bags with 1,000 dried trepang. The filled bags apparently weighed one pickle each. 100 pickles, or 100 filled bags, was apparently a cargo for a prowl. Also, before leaving North Australia, the Macassans left behind empty bags for Indigenous people to fill with baler shell, water buffalo horns and tortoise shell between seasons. Unfortunately, the volume of these bags is unclear. Therefore, I have relied on written South Australian government and British historical sources to resolve this problem. South Australian Government Customs Offices recorded data for the cubic capacity available for cargo of the visiting Macassan prows, as well as their annual average Trapan cargoes. By comparing these, I can determine the proportion of the cargo hold that was allocated to Trapang, and I can also determine how much capacity remained for other commodities. The top table reproduces the customs records of cubic capacity available for cargo in tonnes for 24 named prow from Makassar, visiting North Australia from 1881 to 1907. The bottom table reproduces average Macassan Trapang cargoes in tonnes of weight per prow for 20 recorded years between 1884 and 1905. To determine how much of a prow's cargo hold was filled by Trapang, it is necessary to know the stowage factor for Trapang. The stowage factor is the approximate number of cubic feet that one imperial tonne's weight of trepang occupies in a cargo hold. In the 1930s, the stowage factor from, for one tonne of trepang stowed in bales was between 136 to 150 cubic feet. I have assumed that stowage factors for commodities in the late 19th century were about the same as in the 1930s. Note that stowage factors have been useful for research elsewhere such as in the case of the 20th century timber carrying trade I mentioned on slide one. Using the stowage factor for timber, researchers were able to demonstrate the understatement of prow tonnage in official registration documents. The average cargo capacity per prow in North Australia between 1881 and 1907 was 18.32 tonnes. Given that one gross registered imperial tonne equates to 100 cubic feet, this converts to 1,831 cubic feet. 
By comparison, the average Trepang cargo per prow in the period 1884 to 1905 was 13.94 tonnes. With a stowage factor of 136 to 150 cubic feet per tonne, the average Trepang cargo should occupy some 1,896 to 2,091 cubic feet, and this would effectively fill the entire cargo hold if not overload the ship itself. However, as this figure shows, the amount of trepang harvested annually was volatile. In the lowest recorded trepang season, 1884 to 1885, each prow exported an average of only 8.5 tonnes of trepang, leaving 556 to 675 cubic feet of cargo capacity unutilised. But was that the case? We have seen that more often than not, trepang cargoes were below average. This left spare cargo carrying capacity for other commodities such as tortoise shell and water buffalo horn. The storage factor for one tonne of tortoise shell stowed in cases was 135 to 150 cubic feet, while one tonne of horns, not identified to animal unfortunately, stowed loosely, occupied about 100 cubic feet. In 1882, it was estimated by a customs official that each prow took 10 tonnes of trepang, half a tonne of buffalo horn, and 0.05 tonnes of tortoiseshell for a total of 10.55 tonnes of cargo. This equates to between 1,360 and 1,500 cubic feet of trepang, 50 cubic feet of horns, and 6.75 to 7.5 cubic feet of tortoiseshell for a total of 1,417 to 1,558 cubic feet. Therefore, in 1882, there was still at least 274 to 416 cubic feet of spare cargo capacity. So again, I would ask, did the Parau return to Macassar with partly empty holds? According to my assessment of the history of the maritime Southeast Asian trade, 23 forest and marine commodities were traded by the Macassans from the 16th century until World War I. So all of these 23 commodities were probably sought by Macassans in Northern Australia until proven unavailable. Up to half of these 23 commodities were more valuable than Trepang, so even a small amount would increase the profitability of the Macassan voyages to Meregi, particularly when the Trepang cargo was below average. I am suggesting that there was an average 18.32 tonnes carrying capacity for Macassan prows in North Australia between 1881 to 1907. However, further research is necessary as to whether historical British approaches to calculating cargo carrying capacity and storage are truly applicable to Macassan prows. If you know any sources on Macassan cargo management, I would love to hear from you, and my contact email is on the last slide. Nevertheless, during the period 1884 to 1905, 60% of trepang cargoes were below the average of 13.94 tonnes, while only 40% were above average. Further research is required to determine the reasons behind the annual harvest volatility. Three possible reasons include trepang over-exploitation and recovery, storm or typhoon impact in a particular year, or whether better prices encouraged increased harvesting of other commodities. In any case, in the lowest recorded Japan harvesting season, 1884 to 1885, there remained an average of some 30 to 37 percent available cargo carrying capacity per prow. In conclusion, then, my analysis shows that more often than not, there was as much as, as around one third of spare prow cargo carrying capacity after allowing for Japan. This spare capacity enabled Macassans to export additional commodities from Morega in this period. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kelly, for your uh, presentation, uh, especially for completing our knowledge of the Makassan people when journey to the Australia, and especially the good uh, good it loaded in their ship, which can be uh, knows in details. Thank you very much also. And then next, and then the last of the presentation is uh, Miss Mrs. Ariandi Novita with the title of the, uh, the 
presentation is Palembang's Commodity in Global Trade of Networks. So the time is yours, Mrs. Anjali. Thank you.
Recording in progress. That the Sultan also appointed a person in charge of buying commodities from the community. The person is generally a local ruler in the interior. This condition made it easier for the VOC to launch its business to monopolize trade in Palembang. The paper trading mechanism controlled by the Sultan made it easier for the VOC to control the trade of this commodity on the international market. For the market demands, the Sultan issued a regulation about an obligation to plant paper for his people, called Piagam. The regulated paper trade and agriculture in the Tanjung Village area, Banding Agung District. The Tanjung Charter was issued in 1764 by Sultan Ratu Ahmad Najamuddin. This charter was given to Prince Mangku Hanom and contained regulation that must be obeyed by local residents. One of the things regulated in the charter is the regulation regarding people paper planting and punishment for the residents who do not want to plant it. In addition, there is also a, a civil charter. This charter is a collection of the National Museum and is codenamed Charter No. 10. This charter was issued by the Sultan of Palembang and given to Prawatin Sungai Keruh. Similar to the Tanjung Charter, one of the content of this charter regulates the obligation to plant paper and provides punishment for residents who do not want to plant it. This charter is written in Central Japanese script in the year of 1760. In 1824, the Palembang do Salam Sultanate was dissolved and Palembang became part of uh, the Dutch East Indies, known as Palembang Regenskapen. The 19th century was an era of advancing economic integration throughout the world. The opening of the Suez Canal and the development of steep seam technology were very effective in shortening the shipping time from Netherlands to Dutch East Indies. This condition also affected trade in the Dutch East Indies. Along with this development, the government also made a policy that allowed the private sector to invest the entry of the private sector in increasing the production of Dutch East Indies export commodity. To support the policy, in 1858, a port was built in Palembang. with its facility such as a pier, a pool, and a field for loading and unloading goods. During the period 1824-1864, the port became the lifeblood of Palembang's economy. Development so it was in line with port cities on the island of Java such as Batavia, Gresik, and Cirebon. In 1830, the Dutch East Indies government began to introduce coffee cultivation in Palembang Regenskapen. Coffee grows so well in this region that until the early 20th century, Palembang together with the West Sumatra region accounted for 11% of the Dutch East Indies coffee production. The growing economy in this provided an opportunity for European and American companies to establish their trading office in this region. Generally, these big companies set up their branches in big, big cities on the island of Java, such as Batavia, Surabaya, and Semarang. Until 1930, large trading company began to expand to city outside Java, such as Palembang, Makassar, Medan, Banjarmasin, and Pontianak. This company not only carry out export trade, but also bring in imported goods. Along with this situation, the Dutch East Indies government also made a policy 
that allow the private sector to invest. They started with the opportunity to invest in the establishment of plantation, expanding into the mining sector. This condition is further supported by world demand for rubber and oil commodities. Until 1930, Palembang's rubber contributed about one-third of the total export commodities. Mining activities in Palembang region Skapen began with oil exploration in Banyuasin in 1885, then in Lamatang Ilir and Muara Inim in 1897. In addition, coal mining also began in Bukit Asam and began exploration in 1919. The construction of an oil refinery in Plaju and Pendopo and the opening of coal mine in Bukit Asam increased export commodity produced by Palembang Rekan Skapen. In 1840, a road network began to be built connecting Palembang with inland area which were producer of export commodity. Just like the road network, the construction of the railway network in Palembang Rekan Skapen which began in 19. 14 was primarily intended for the transportation of goods, especially mining and plantation products. The construction of the first trail is carried out from Kertapati, Palembang to Prabu Mulih along 78 km, then from Prabu Mulih to the south until it met the rail built from Tanjung Karang. In this case, Prabu Mulih is the intersection point the to the south and west. The train line from Prabu Muli to the south to Batu Raja and Martapura, while to the west toward Muara Enim, Lahat, Tebing Tinggi, and Lubuk Linggau. Overall, the southbound road was completed in 1924 and the westbound road was completed in 1933. Based on this description, it can be concluded that the existence of Palembang Strait commodities is influenced by world market demand. This condition lasted from the Sriwijaya to the Dutch is in this colonial era. Initially, Palembang's commodities were in the form of forest products collected by the community. In subsequent, they turned into cultivated plant. The trading system also changes. If during the Sriwijaya and Sultanate era, the king or sultan was in control, then during the Dutch East Indies colonial period, this role was replaced by multinational company. The development of trade in Palembang caused many multinational companies to build representative office. This representative agent has a dual role, namely in addition as a manager of buying and selling merchandise, it is also obliged to look for product in the area around Palembang. That's my presentation. For that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Andini. And I think this is very interesting because she has a presentation of uh, many uh, uh, commodity during uh, several time period. So I think this is a new one for us. So we, uh, the Mrs. Andini is the last of the presentation. So that, but we still have, uh, I think, uh, five minutes uh, uh, question for the question because after that we will, uh, according to the, to the, the uh, committee, it will be the close uh, closing ceremony. So uh if you have a uh, for dear participant if you have a uh, 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 question or asking question to the uh, speakers just please write into the the uh, chat of the zoom i think just please or if uh, you of of the speakers will ask a question uh, between you or i think it's you can also uh, uh, open please so uh, I'm really sorry because uh, the 
the committee also have a warm minute. The time is, uh, is I think we will continue to the, to the closing ceremony. Uh, but I, and anyway, but from this, this session, I think very interesting because many, many uh, things uh, new come from uh, our knowledge about the, the people in the, in the uh, uh, of spice root and activity of people and activity in spice root. Thank you so, so much, uh, uh, speaker, all of the speaker, and uh, I will give it the time to the organizing committee. Back to the. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Hello, Anita. Hello, Anita. Okay, please. Yes, you are welcome. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Bainita. Good uh, evening, maybe to some of you. And well, it's in Jakarta, it's also uh, close to evening. Uh, so I was asked to uh, kind of uh, provide some reflections for our long for these uh, discussions. So allow me to. Uh, just uh, present a short uh, reflection of what have been uh, uh, discussed in these uh, days. Yeah. Allow me to share uh, uh, some of my slides. So, let's start. Actually, the so, okay, let, let me uh, explain my positions. I am a researcher at the Research Center for Society and Culture at BRIN, uh, collaborators of uh, these uh, events. Uh, but uh, BRIN uh, is only uh, involved in this, uh, what do you call it, a seminar or, or, or conference. It's part of the events that uh, are organized by uh, Yayasan Negeri Rempah uh, or Negeri Rempah Foundations. Uh, so I'm not sure if I speak on behalf of uh, the whole 
IFSR or just on this moment? Uh, 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 please uh, excuse me of mixing of that things. It might it be uh, difficult to differentiate anyhow. So the discussions of uh, Spice Road started, in my opinion, with the movement, uh, or at least it's generated uh, in the movement of uh, Spice Road reconstructions or revitalizations uh, led by the Director General of uh, Culture and the Ministry of uh, Education and uh, Culture. So I think I, if SRs can be uh, considered as part of that kind of movement and, and it's established to serve a kind of uh, as a platform platform of exchange cross-cultural knowledge and understanding by strengthening common heritage which is what we call uh, generally as the spice roots so uh, ifss is also a, a forum to open cross boundaries and cross-cultural dialogues to represent the the research the relief and maintains any things related to spice roots. We believe that this kind of effort can uh, lead us to uh, have more uh, collaborations in the time of a uh, challenging uh, now and challenging future. So uh, now, we have been talking about uh, spice roots actually, but we haven't really defined what is this, what the spice roots is or are if there are so many roots there. This is what I uh, would like to suggest. I should confess this might be a bias uh, by uh, my anthropological thinking, but uh, hopefully it can. Uh, provide a kind of framework to look at what we are, uh, how or where we are in regard to this uh, uh, framework uh, and also in regard to the discuss discussions that we have in these days. So for me, of course, uh, 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 Spice Roads is uh, worth or has been started by person or social uh, groups with certain motives or uh, driven by certain drivers uh, uh, to fulfill their needs or their wish to move around, to, uh, to migrate from one particular place or space to another place. Of course, when they are moving, they bring with them along the sociocultural and material loads. Uh, 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 even their families, uh, we can see it, it uh, represented, for example, in the current uh, diaspora's uh, uh, realities. With the, these migrations, of course, interactions, uh, which lead to sociocultural or material exchange or of migrat migrating people with their host uh, taken place. And it produces new or hybrid or, uh, sociocultural forms it can be in the form of ideas, socio and material uh, culture as well, as well as the changes on the social ecosystems. It can be the changes of sea landscape, uh, 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 lands, sea and lands, land, landscape changes or elements of particular ecosystems. And uh, this ha has been uh, or taking place so long, centuries or millenniums, uh, and, we, and this pattern can produce something, or we can also reflect something from what has been uh, happening with uh, uh, this, uh, is, which is called as uh, a spice roots. Uh, uh, so, for example, if we are talking specifically with uh, about spice in its physical form, we are talking about cloves and others uh, herbs uh, and all the implications driven by the search for uh, clubs and exchange or uh, roots or, or tra um, uh, migrating traditions and sociocultural and even ecological, ecos ecological implications of that. And uh, we know, for example, in uh, the first, second and these days uh, of discussion in 
uh, EIFSR, many things have been discussed about these things. We can also avoid, then when we are talking about uh, the proposal of uh, <coughs> of proposal of uh, uh, what submitting this road or spice road as a, a world heritage with uh, with that uh, we have to find of course the outstanding universal value of uh, of as a reflex terms or as you know core values of these uh, patterns and also for me, the most important is the reflections of finding the values which can be used for contemporary use of functions of the heritage. For me, hopefully, at the end, we can uh, understand that we are not uh, a total strangers uh, through the price routes, different type of spice routes. Spice in the uh, not only referring to the spice as her, but also different commodities, even ideas related to uh, these uh, traditions. Uh, with that, we, uh, we with the uh, understanding that we are not total strangers, we said something uh, partially or even uh, maybe uh, more than. Uh, you know, uh, well, a, a, a great deal of elements of our culture, even, uh, you know, ha physical heritage, the test of DNA showing that we are not, uh, we are mixed of every different uh, nations in our, our bl blood. And of course, we can also see the exchange, the mix of uh, culture and social structure and also uh, material elements. With that, uh, uh, what do you call it? Kesadaran, the, the awareness. We hope that being as uh, those who know each other, at least had a part of ours between each other, we can uh, give helping hand to each other to live in harmony for a better world, for a better, for a better. Uh, 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 what we call it, well-being of the different uh, people, particularly in the uh, developing countries, but generally in the globe, the, the population of the globe. So let me now uh, continue with the uh, our uh, discussions and putting our discussions in the framework that I just uh, explained. So this, uh, uh, what do call it a forum or seminar or conference uh, provides or discuss uh, six different uh, panels or topics. The first one is identity, equality, and globalization. With this course, we are hoping that we can discuss uh, uh, Spice Root as an entry point for development and uh, nurturing collaborations for the current uh, reflecting the, the, from the history but uh, using for the uh, current and uh, future uh, uh, life of us. The second is sustainable development and natural diversity along the spice route. Uh, we uh, discussed the natural diversity, the diversity and its protection for future sustainable development. So for the first uh, panel, we have three uh, presenters and uh, the second one is 10 presenters. The Third uh, panel is culture for creativity, innovation, and livelihoods. We try to understand intercultural, uh, you know, uh, exchange or understanding as the key to creativity and innovation to sustainable socioeconomic developments, creating jobs, and you know, this is part of uh, making the history uh, 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 life or uh, uh, become. Uh, uh, modalities for the current uh, developments, the current of people. The, uh, we have uh, five uh, presenters here, and the fourth is disaster relief and constructions. We only have two presenters here in this panel, and the fifth is fishers and fisheries. We only have three uh, presentations here, and the last is seafaring and trading routes. We have 14 uh, presentations. So the total presenters is 37 
for 10 minutes presentations and 17 plus uh, presentation, which is combined with poster. The poster which will be displayed from 20th to 27th of November uh, at the National Library. Yeah. Now, let me have, you know, provide some insight or at least my understandings of what we have been discussed uh, uh, in these uh, days, reflecting at least from the numbers of the presenters and the, the, the uh, 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 materials, discussed materials. Uh, so we can see that seafaring and trading, trading routes uh, uh, had a, 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 a most uh, papers, presentations. We can see it's dominated by historian or historical studies of specific focus. Of course, the focus is on specific uh, seafaring and trading routes. And in, in some cases, you're also talking about uh, some socio-cultural implications. But this uh, uh, fact, I, I believe, representing the advanced uh, historical uh, studies on these uh, spice routes. Uh, uh, of course, this is uh, reflecting the richness of the discussions and the deep uh, discussions of particular issues in this regard, the safering and trading routes. But I believe if you look, go back to the <coughs> framework that I uh, just presented in previous slides, this is more talking about the past. We are still uh, uh, in need of discussing what does it imply to the current life and the futures. Uh, but I believe that also, uh, well, uh, that uh, whole uh, is a, a little bit, uh, you know, filled by quite uh, some uh, presentations on the panel too, which uh, discuss about the sustainable development and natural diversity along the Swiss route. This is more or less talking about the history, of course, but also the current implications of uh, the spice routes or the, uh, you know, issues associated or we clustered it uh, spice route. So with that, I think we have some homeworks to be uh, discussed further in 2023 if we still uh, want to continue uh, the livelihood, uh, the lively discussion about this. That is, you know, finding the, the, or rebuild the complete constructions of the spice route as I described in the chart uh, in the previous uh, uh, slides. And also more getting a reflection of the meanings of those historical uh, uh, events, incidents for the current uh, uh, purpose, the current uh, you know, use of those. Uh, this is what might be uh, called in the context of uh, the proposal for World Heritage, identifying the uh, universal values of the spice routes, which at the end can be used as a modalities for development of more further collaborations, both in development of science, but also in real developments to make uh, our lives a, a better life. The, the third, the last part is initiating or starting to initiate the collaborations of various uh, 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 you know uh, people various uh, experts for, for from various uh, disciplines this is the things that I'd like to uh, emphasize yeah uh, uh, highlight a little bit that what we have discussed so far is small mono disciplines perspective I believe we need a kind of uh, you know, serious effort to start discussing across uh, uh, disciplines, start talking about uh, transdisciplinary uh, uh, in the constructions of what we call as a spice route. That might be a good initiative uh, uh, for the start of uh, real co collaborations in the academia, as well as hopefully that can trigger the real collaborations on uh, or for developments, real activities of making our world uh, better. Thank you. That is more or less my reflection for our uh, for this discussions.
All right, Kang Dedi, thank you so much for your valuable closing reflection. And and the last but not least, we will let Kang Bram Kusharyanto, the founder and chairman of Negeri Rempa Foundation, for the closing remark. Kang Bram, are you there? All right, time is yours, Kang Bram. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Selamat untuk kita semua. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Rahayu. Uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, sahabat negeri rempah dimanapun kita berada, distinguished guests, and also all participation in this forum. Uh, hari ini kita sudah tiba di penghujung program di mana selama empat hari ini kita berkumpul dan saling berdiskusi membahas berbagai hal yang terkait dengan jalur rempah. Hal ini tentu sejalan dengan semangat jalur rempah yang mengedepankan intercultural dialogue. So the spirit of this spice food will prioritize intercultural connectedness and dialogue. Jadi ini merupakan hal yang sangat uh, mengesankan bagi kami melihat antusiasme yang tinggi dari para cendekiawan yang hadir mempresentasikan lebih dari 100 makalah di IFS tahun ini. It is very impressive to us to see this high enthusiasm of the scholars who presented more than 100 papers at the IFSR this year. Untuk itu, izinkan kami mengucapkan terima kasih sekaligus menyampaikan penghargaan yang setinggi-tingginya. Allow us to express our gratitude and our highest uh, appreciation to National Research and Innovation Agency, to Prof. Uh, Najib Burani, Chairman of the Institute of Social Science and Humanities, Dr. Lili Smulyati of the Center for Research and Society and Culture. Ini adalah kerjasama yang luar biasa. Amazing collaboration from the preparation period to the completion of today's event. Uh, IFSR tidak akan sebagus ini tanpa kolaborasi yang terjadi seperti ini. Let us also express our gratitude to the Director General of Culture, Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology, the Indonesian Embassy in Beijing, Samudra Indonesia, Dalian Maritime University in China, Malanda University India, Raja Ratnam School of International Studies Singapore, Universitas Indonesia, Climate Reality Indonesia, Connected Art Platform Switzerland, Format P, Komunitas Bambu, Sahabat Cagar Budaya Palembang. Tak kalah juga penting adalah hadirnya para narasumber dan pakar yang telah sangat berperan dalam IFSR tahun ini. We would like to say thanks to Dr. Dedi Aduri and Dr. Maulana Ibrahim as the conveners of this year IFSR. Our reviewers, Professor Dr. Agus Heri Purnomo, Dr. Sony Wibisono, Dr. Zamron Salim, Dr. Wawan Sujarwo, Dr. Dave Lumenta, Dr. Jajang Gunawijaya, Dr. Tukul Rameo, Pak Irfan Mahmud, Dr. Andes Masyuri Imron, Bapak Irfan Nugraha, Ibu Dewi Kumorati, Bapak Uus Faisal Firdausi, Ibu Widya Fitri, and last but not least, we also would like to thanks to all the member of IFSR Committee of Negeri Rempah Foundation and also Jaringan Nasion, Jaringan Masyarakat Negeri Rempah. Ini gotong royong yang terjadi di IFSR tahun ini sungguh mengagumkan bagi kami di Yayasan Negeri Rempah. Your participation is IFSR is so astonishing. It's a, an honor to, for us. Akhir kata, Yayasan Negeri Rempah atas nama Yayasan Negeri Rempah on behalf of Negeri Rempah Foundation, I announce that the International Forum on Spice Route 2022 is officially closed. Sampai jumpa, Sampai jumpa di IFSR 2023. See you at IFSR next year from 19 to 23 September 2023. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi Santi Santi. Yeah. Thank you, Mas Bram. Yeah. Uh, chili is red, turmeric is low. Chili is red, turmeric is yellow, and oregano is green. See you everyone in the next International Forum for Spice Route 2023. From Palembang, South Sumatra, Indonesia, we will say see you next year. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>